invite you to um, greet your neighbor, say hello, shake a hand, give some hugs, and just, yeah, just in, um, see how everyone's doing this morning. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. I am happy to be back. I know everybody's been asking, how was my trip? I'm going to share about that in a couple minutes. Uh, but I am very happy to be back. Um, I'll be happy as well when my luggage gets back. Uh, it took a longer holiday, and so uh, it'll, it'll get here eventually. Um, but no, I'm, I'm happy to be back, and I'm excited to be here and really wanting to share kind of where some of the cool things about Mozambique and, and South Africa uh, but I think before we do that, we got a whole, we got a lot, of, a lot going on actually in the program today. Uh, and so if I talk too long about other stuff, we won't get to it. So uh, let's quickly get through some of those other things. Um, primarily, I want to remind everybody that next week, I want to see a crowd this big. I want to see all of you still commit to show up and be part of our church service next 
Sunday at the St. Malo Campground uh, in site number two. We're going to be having our church service as an outdoor service, just a time of fellowship and singing uh, and, and some encouragement, maybe some testimonies, a devotional. Uh, but if we can make it here on a Sunday morning, I'm sure we can make it uh, to the beach as well on the Sunday morning. And so we're going to go to St. Mall, have a great time. Um, and so I look forward to uh, seeing all of you guys there. A couple other things in the bulletin. Uh, Fisher Bay Baba Camp's looking for some head cooks, some lifeguards, some cabin leaders starting July 11th. Um, and if you're interested in helping, uh, there's some numbers there for you to contact. I used to direct that camp, a uh, wonderful camp. I loved it, uh, just north of uh, Pegwis and Fisher River Reserves. Uh, it's a very unique experience, um, and uh, if that's something you're interested in, uh, check that out. Also, VBS uh, begins today um, uh, at Abundant Life Fellowship. The website's listed there. Register your kids, uh, and there's also a whole bunch of other opportunities that you can take a look at. Um, also, not next week, not just are we doing the church service uh, in St. Malo, but we also have church camping. So if you just want to be part of the family and just want to hang out and get to know each other deeper and have fun and hang out at the beach and sit around the fire and all that other stuff, um, check-in is Friday at 11 a.m. And there's still room to sign up for church camping uh, in the group site. So take a look, message the church, get a hold of Joanne. But if you're interested in, in camping, she's got all the details. I don't actually know any of them, um, so you'll just have to contact her and follow up on that. Congratulations to uh, Kira and Carson who got married this weekend. Um, and so they're not here, but the parents are here. So we, uh, it was a wonderful wedding. I was, I was uh, able to attend that wedding, and it was a great time uh, for an amazing couple. And so uh, it was good. Am I missing any important announcements? Except for that, that one, obviously. Yeah. If not, is that right? First anniversary for JJ Victoria? Yeah. Woo! Go ahead. We have people who just got to go stand up. Can we get them to stand up? Am I going to embarrass them? I totally embarrassed them, didn't I? All right. <laughs> Then, tomorrow morning at 2.30 a.m., a bunch of crazy people, no, um, 2.30 a.m., uh, the youth uh, going to Kenya and the helpers and everybody else are meeting here at 2.30 so they can get heading to the airport because they're supposed to be there three hours before their flight, which is at 7 in the morning. Uh, so tomorrow morning at 2.30 um, is the beginning of this journey that they have been planning for a year they are excited, they're passionate, uh, they're a little bit nervous, uh, there's a lot going on, and uh, often when we do missions trips, we go and people go and they build stuff or they do something specific and solid, and we are going to support somebody else's work. And so we basically told them, whatever you want us to do, that's what they're going to do. So Heather says they're going to do some door-to-door -door evangelism, is that right? Yeah, they're going to do some children's ministry. They're going to do, uh, they're going to be there for the opening of a, of a, a new church plot uh, in some, in Messiah area, which is a tribal group there. They have got a lot going on with a guy who plants churches there in Kenya, a local Kenyan guy, works with kids, does church planning and discipleship. They are incredibly excited. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to invite every team member to come to the front as we often do here. All the team members, chop, chop. You know how long-winded I am for everything else later, so. Uh, <laughs> what? All right. Do, are you going to need this mic for anything? Are you wanting to say something? or? Is it on? It's on. Thank you guys so much for your prayers and support over the last year. Um, this kind of seemed like a dream when we started, and I mean, when we started, no one was flying yet. <laughs> um, and 
no countries were open and there were so many mandates that we couldn't really even meet as a church family. So um, for us to now be able to go, um, we don't even have to test for COVID before we leave because the United States dropped that requirement. So we are like free and clear to leave tomorrow morning and it's just super exciting for us to see how many miracles have happened, um, not the least of which was getting Brooklyn's passport. Um, that in itself was an absolute miracle. So we are so thankful for all the things and the answered prayers that we've seen. I know these kids have grown. Um, each and every one of them have grown in the last year. And I'm excited to see how they're going to grow more and how their relationship with Christ is going to develop and deepen over the next couple of weeks. Um, we covet your prayers. Please keep praying for us. Um, in particular, myself, I actually missed Kieran Carson's wedding, which I'd been looking to forward to for over a year already. <laughs> Um, because I was so stressed that I actually ended up, like, sick. So um, if you could just pray for me that um, I'd just be able to let go and let God. Um, it is what it is. I've got a credit card and a passport. Anything else we can just rebuy, right? So we're good. <laughs> um, so uh, that's what Rick keeps telling me. As long as you've got your credit card and your passport, you're fine, Heather. Um, so <laughs> so um, just pray for us as a group. Um, pray for us individually, and uh, pray also for Charles and Anne that uh, we'll be able to be a blessing to them and to their ministry. And again, thank you so much for your prayers, and please keep them coming. All right, so if they've got family and friends who want to pray, you guys got to scooch up to that yellow line, by the way. That's scooch, scooch, scooch. Uh, if there's any uh, family and friends who want to come and lay hands on them as we pray, uh, you are welcome to come and do that. So, uh, and our church family, anybody who wants... Is there somebody who wants to do the prayer? I will even let somebody do the prayer if they want. All right, then I will pray. God, you are an incredible God, and you have blessed us with an incredible group of young people. Young people who love your, love your word, love, love you, and just want to do whatever they can to, to bless other people. And so, God, I just pray that you will keep them safe. You will keep them moving in a good direction. You will keep them from being too overtired in their journeys as they get up at 2, two in the morning, some of them. Maybe some of them won't even sleep. Uh, but, God, help them to be a blessing Help them to always be led by you. Help them to be a team. Uh, and help them to realize that, that they can change the world as they are faithful to you. God, also bless all the parents at home. Help them not to get too afraid and too nervous. Uh, and help this to just be an incredible, incredible experience for these young men and women. In your awesome and holy name, we love you. Keep them safe. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. As you guys are heading to your seats, I am told to remind you that there is a trip Instagram page. There is a trip Instagram page that we will let you guys, we'll connect it with our, face, with our church Facebook and in our church emails. We'll send you that link. There is an Instagram page to follow all of the great things that are happening. And now I'll wait for everything to calm down. I'll give it a couple seconds here. All right. So I do have a full message planned for today, but I also realize that I don't think it's fair, probably even right, for me to go all the way to Africa and then come back and just jump right into a message without sharing some of the trip. I think if we're going to send our pastor to go overseas, it's probably good for us to know what he did over there and, and kind of where God is moving. And so... Uh, there's a couple of things I'm not going to talk about a lot because we can talk about that one-on-one -on -one with people. Uh, but I, I want to talk about two different things that I did. I, uh, when I went, when I flew over, I stopped in South Africa. I went down to Cape Town. That's where Mike Fast and Andrew, uh, where their church is. That they came out here a couple months ago. I went and spent about four days with their, with their church, group of churches that they are a part of, kind of learning and growing and experiencing. And I'll share that in the second half. And then, and then I went... 
to Mozambique, where you know I love going there. It's my heart, my passion. Uh, and I had an incredible, incredible time. And I'm going to try to, in like three minutes, summarize what made it so awesome. Um, number one, I got to go to our Bible training program. It's called SBF. Uh, and it has grown so much that we now have 50 Bible school leaders, if you would, local community Bible school leaders who have graduated. So now the program's so big and been doing so well, they have to run like two different weeks worth of training, um, which was really cool to see that success. Um, the second, so I got to visit with guys I, I kind of, I spent years and years ministering to uh, and being part of their churches in some way or another. Um, the next thing that I was just blown away by was the amount of young people that Heather cared for in the orphan program who have gone off to be extremely successful in whatever field they were part of. Uh, most of these kids grew up in mud houses with grass roofs. I remember uh, twins, Abel and Zachariah, uh, when I first met them, the place they were living in, you could literally see, like, light from the other side of the building. It was about nine feet by nine feet sticks, and the mud had all come off, and so you could basically, it was just a kid's fort, it looked like. And uh, Abel has just defending his thesis this week for his civil engineering degree. Um, and so he's, he is still having a hard time getting work. Uh, he did get a great job from a guy, who, a foreigner who'd come in and then went bankrupt this last month because, <laughs> so it's always hard for these young men to get jobs and I'm working with a couple organizations right now in Africa to try and get a Bella job, but he's basically got a civil engineering degree, which is something he have never fathomed before. Um, Zachariah has is, is now got a degree in, in agriculture, a specialized agriculture degree, and he's serving at the mission. Um, and uh, it's been amazing, you know, talking to Dwight, he said, look, we had to take a look at this and say, although we're a mission who hasn't always been able to pay people at a certain level, um, we gave him the degree, we're going to pay him at the degrees level. And, uh, or at least at, at, the base, at the base level of what that degree offers. And so Zachariah is now at the mission, caring for our agriculture program, our animals, which are finally being successful enough that they're paying his salary and paying many other people's salary. So much of the work that we poured our hearts and souls into while we were there, having to just, it felt like just always pouring into and pouring into. So many of those ministries are now pouring back into the mission. And I thought, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Empowering people to do so much of that work on their own. Uh, and then I got to go see Gervasio. This is the third one of those young men, all about the same age. He went off and got a degree to be a, got an got a education to be a pharmacist. And so he is now a pharmacist. And again, he's moved from the, the rural kind of mud hut into the city. Uh, he's met a, a young woman who's a teacher in another area now. They met when they were off at school. And so he's getting married. Uh, November 26th, I uh, really wanted us to come out, and I don't think we'll be able to make it, but November 26th, he's getting married um, in an actual proper civil ceremony, which is very rare in Mozambique. Um, but he's found an educated young woman who's getting married to her, and, and here's a really cool part of the story. Two things. Number one, when he went to get his degree, he met our young man, they became close friends, and he basically lived at this guy's house half the time. And this guy's mom was the governor of the whole area. And, uh, so she began to pour into his life, and she was basically a second parent to him. Um, and, uh, and so he lived, he, li he kind of hung out there all the time and learned and grew and became part of the family. And, and, uh, and so now she has actually talked to him and said, was this your actual dream? Has this always been your dream to be a pharmacist? And he says, well, it's basically it's the only dream he knew, but now, man, it would be great if one day he could be a doctor. And so she, in her role as governor, has seemingly been able to make some of her connections come through. And and uh, it looks like this young man from the Little Mud Hut um, is possibly going to medical school uh, to be a doctor. And we thought, wow, I'm tearing up because uh, before, when we first went to the program, I don't think we had a single graduate um, in all the years that it had been around. And we now have three young guys who graduated from university. Um, so this guy's getting married November 26th. And in, in Mozambique, if you're going to get married, you have to send your father or a padrino, a, a father figure, to go and kind of negotiate what this wedding marriage is going to look like. You have to have this. You don't just get to go talk to the father. You have to send a representative. And uh, so his representative, so his, his second family is the governor's family, his representative, the man who's standing in for him to be his father figure, 
is the administrator of our district, who is also a pastor, uh, who spoke at SBF this last time that I was there. Um, and again, I thought to myself, wow, things we could not have imagined so many years ago. The governor and the administrator paid a visit to our school while I was there. I didn't go to the visit. Um, actually, we only sent the locals to the visit. So, and in that visit, they donated a half a ton of rice to our feeding program. Um, we were on the news as a program that is being successful in training local people to do local things, um, which was amazing because it, we made sure there was, we didn't need to have any white people in the video. Uh, we're making the news around the country for things like that. Uh, and I thought, wow, it's, it's God is doing something great. And it took many, 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 many years for that to happen. And many failures, many hurts, many discouragements. Um, but we're seeing God do some really, really incredible things. And finally, with this part of the story, there's lots more that I could share, but with this part of the story, the only other two things is that Dwight, me and Dwight have been talking a lot about uh, his family's very sick and, and he's, uh, he's needing to eventually <laughs> leave the mission field. Um, and so we were talking about what that would look like and how I could help back home um, and, and, and the ways that I could serve and, and be part of the ministry from here in Canada. And so you may see that I travel to different places in Canada every now and again uh, to help the mission succeed uh, and, and to grow some of the ministry that they're doing. But one of the things that always happens when I go over to Mozambique is that I come home and everybody says, man, I bet it was hard to leave. I bet you're just eagerly waiting till God lets you go back. And uh, more often than not, my answer is yes, that's exactly it. And I realized on this journey through my time in Cape Town, but also through my time in Mozambique, that when I left Mozambique, I did not leave wishing I could stay, only that I could return more often. And what I mean by that is, I love this church. I love this place. And the longer that I am back home, my passion for Mozambique does not fade, it only grows but praise the Lord, God gives us more passion than we knew we could have. And my passion for Grunthal grows. My passion for local surrounding community grows. I believe that we are going to be doing church planting in the future through Abundant Life. I believe that we're going to make changes in Abundant Life. I think things are going to be done differently as we move forward. And God is giving me more and more desire and passion for a specific calling that I believe He's placing on my life. And so yes, you may see me go to Africa more often, and we may get to see our elders thrive as they come up and preach and, and teach in different ways because that's what the biblical church looks like, not just me standing up front every single Sunday. It may mean me going to get more training and development. It actually may mean me not being here quite as much, but be, when I am here, being more effective at what I'm doing. But I realize that God has called me to this place for a purpose and for a design. Not only that, how in the world can I ever be an outreach to the pastors of Africa without understanding what it means to lead a church here in Canada? And so I am feeling more and more that God is, is I am seeing God's, God's handiwork in every single step of my journey of life. And so I'm excited for what God is doing. And often I see, if you were to, if you were to imagine what I, what I envision in my life is, is I love the image of Paul as he travels along, feeding into the different churches, being a builder of churches, whether or not we, was, we were planting or, or building into. I, I really want to be a person who's able to build in to churches both here and around the world while I continue to, to lead in some way here at Abundant Life. So when you see me go to Africa, know I want to keep going, but know that I love it here, and I love you, and I love where we're going. And I believe that there's an incredible revival coming. It's going to have its ups, it's going to have its downs, but it's going to be amazing. And it's actually what led me to four, day, four or five days in Cape Town. Uh, as you guys know, Andrew and Mike were here and they shared, um, and it, it, they shared about their ministry and they've, they've been sharing some things that have been very intriguing to me and I was able to go to Cape Town and, and see their church and how it functioned there. and It was amazing, absolutely. It, is, it was so overwhelming. I have never worshipped why well, I shouldn't say that. I have not worshipped it with such a passion as I did down in Cape Town. Um, I have not seen people worship with that kind of passion 
in, 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 in so, so many years. I, it reminds me of my days at Bible camp, to be honest, where, where, where staff training times, we're, we're shouting, we're singing, we're, we're crying, we're, we're on our knees. We had this incredible moment. And, and every service I went to while I was there just was a reflection of what I see in the Bible. Uh, it was scary at times because, as I told somebody else, um, this is not something we're going to teach about today, but it was, it was weird at times because some of the Holy Spirit stuff that was going on there, uh, it was something outside of my comfort zone, and as I am a skeptic in many ways, I picked up, I was like, okay, is this done in the, in the exact way that the Bible would tell it should be done? And everything that I saw happening was done just exactly like I would have read in the Bible. Um, and so it was, it was interesting. Even to the point, as, a, as an interesting example of this, is that there was, and I'm not going to, for those who don't know some of these things, I'm going to try and be very brief, uh, but there was somebody who came up to the, to the, to the pastor and, and said, could they share, and they, share, and they were speaking in tongues, and, and I immediately got uncomfortable because, because I think many of us know that would make us a little bit uncomfortable. Somebody took the mic and just started speaking to something we didn't understand. And another elderly lady, she came up, she actually pushed me away a little bit. She's like, hey, I need to get through here, sir. Excuse me, excuse me. She comes to the front. She taps the guy on the shoulder, and he looks around, and he says, and I can hear him very clearly. He says, he says, do you have an interpretation? I went, what? We don't see that anymore. That's, what the, that's, how, that's how it's written in the Bible. It's what it says in the Bible. I'm like, but that seemed odd to me. And, and so he wouldn't let anybody else touch the mic until somebody else came and shared what the, what the, what that. And then as the lady was sharing, another man comes up, and he taps the guy on the shoulder. And the guy turns around and says, do you have something to add to this? And the guy said, yes. And the guy opens up his Bible, and he begins to read Scripture that is 100% exactly in line with what these other two words had shared, what these other sharings had happened. I thought, wow. Was it a little bit wild? Yeah. Was it a little bit uncomfortable at times? Sure. But it was so in line with what I read in the Bible, I thought, wow, it's hard to argue when things are done exactly like they are said to be done in the Bible. Uh, and so it was a really cool experience. Not only that, I got to see a couple other, just the, the way of, of hospitality and humility and, and servanthood in just a, such an incredible way. Uh, and then finally, like I said, the worship was just out of this world. Um, if you remember when Andrew came here and he talked about, hey, how can we cheer, how can we cheer at a hockey game or we dance at a wedding, but uh, we come to church and we just sit on our hands. And... Uh, and we are, we, we're the bride of Christ. Why can't we show up and just dance and shout and sing and celebrate? And so it was an incredible time. And now I've spent a huge portion of our time talking about that. But I want you to know that every, I, God has just laid on my heart more and more and more. Are we reading the Bible and just doing what it says? Throwing away everything else and just reading the Bible. And if the Bible says it, are we willing to do it? as uncomfortable, as awkward uh, as it may be, read the Bible. Do what it says. So that being said, all that, all that wrapped up, I still do want to give a message today, and it's not a short one. So um, what I've decided to do today as we jump into the message is that we've got 16 people going off to Kenya, and they're actually going to be thrown under the bus a little bit where they're going to have to do some speaking, it sounds like. Maybe just the leaders, who knows? Uh, but uh, what I, one thing I've learned from Africa, my wife's saying no, one thing I've learned from Africa is that you don't often get a say uh, of what's going to look like until you walk through the doors. And so somebody says, oh, so which one of you is speaking? Or, um, hey, who's singing a song for us today? Um, and so, praise the Lord, I normally go by myself and they know not to give me the singing. Um, but what I thought I would do today is I would put a message in a style and a format that could be used anywhere in the world. Um, so it may be a little bit simpler in some ways, but more complex in others. Uh, and you'll see what I mean as we move on. So, before we get started with the message, let's start with a word of prayer. God, you are amazing. God, I'm so excited for what you're doing uh, in Mozambique. So excited for what you're doing uh, in South Africa. I'm excited for God, what you want to do right here in Grunthal and our surrounding community. God, I want to pray that as you, I share this word that you've put on my heart, that it would go in the direction that you would have it go and people would hear how much you truly love them and have a plan for their lives. In your awesome and holy name, amen. Amen. Apparently, apparently, there we go. My old notes from way back when, nobody, I, I didn't take them down last time, so they're still up here from like a month ago. There we go. So get started because there are young people here today. I am going to get somebody who is 
willing to come up for like two minutes and, and help me out here up at the front a little bit. Uh, and I have, a, I have a prize. I have a prize for anybody who comes. And it cannot be my kids. <laughs> do I, one of these, do I, you want to come up? Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Mostly I just, I just going to ask some questions. And I have a prize. Okay, um, I'll come down there. That's easier. All right, so you know rock, paper, scissors? Okay, let's do what we'll do just to see who, who yeah, ready? I'm going to do paper, by the way. So that's what I always do. It's the best one. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors. This time, ready? Rock, paper, scissors. Ha! One more time. Rock, paper, scissors. There we go. Okay, he beat me. Scissors. Scissors cuts paper, right? All right, so I got a question for you, um, and it's, it's going to determine the prize that I give you. Um, which is stronger? George? No. Um, <laughs> George fighting with a sword of metal or George trying to fight with a sword of paper? That's right. George with a sword of metal is stronger than George with a sword of paper. Yes, st metal is stronger than paper, right? Um, now, I don't, know, I don't know how much you know about paper and metal, but which one do you think um, is harder to make? Paper. It's harder? Yeah, because I don't know. I would say metal. Melt it down. Okay, so she says paper. I would say I would say metal, but that's okay. We can argue about that. So, so uh, which 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 is stronger, an axe or a tree? He's too deep for me. I just want simple answers. The axe cuts down the tree. Okay, this he's going to give me the other wrong answer now too. I know this. He is going to give it. So, if I have a prize for you, and my prize, I'm either going to give you a prize of strong metal or weak paper. Which one do you want? Just pick. Pick. Strong metal, weak paper. <laughs> strong metal. Okay. You got the right answer here. Whew. Because I didn't want to give him the paper. <laughs> strong metal, weak paper. There you go. He gets the strong metal. <laughs> Whew. This, this guy had me nervous. This guy had me nervous. Are you sure you want the strong metal? Over the weak paper? You want to trade or no? He wants to trade. Okay, but the, uh, it's easy because, he, how about this? I'm just going to wreck the paper a little. I'm going to crumple the paper. How about now? You mean yes. <laughs> yeah, but look at your pedal. So take that out. That, try and do that with this. Try and crumple your money. Try it. You can't, right? This one's weak. You sure you still want the money? How about now? Rub it in the floor. How about now? Now it's dirty, it's wrinkled, it's not even any good anymore. Which one do you want? No, I'm not giving it to him anyways. Take your money and go. Good job, thank you very much. I get to keep the crink crinkled up money. There's a point to this, obviously, regardless of how the questions got answered. There is a point to this illustration. And the point that I want to get to is who determines something's value. You see, we couldn't agree on which was more harder to make. I think metal's harder to, to make something out of. He thinks wood's harder to make something out of. I think the trees, the, the axe is stronger. He thinks the tree is stronger. We couldn't agree on that. And that's okay because at the end of the day, we both agreed that this was worth $20 and that was worth one. So how did we come to that conclusion? If we couldn't agree on the value of paper over metal, we couldn't agree on the strength of wood over metal, but we could agree that this is worth more money than the shiny loony that I gave him. And so the question today for all of us is how do we know what our value is? Who determines our value? And it's pretty simple, actually. There's two major ways that value is determined in this world that we live in. Number one, when it comes to currency. That's one way that we can value something, currency. And currency is given its value not based on its quality, because if you look at this $20 bill, I don't even think it's made out of paper anymore. It's melted down grocery bags. Um, like, <laughs> this, this, 
this piece of plastic weird material is worth $20 and, and some is worth $100 and some is, and they all look the same except for a different little bit of an imprint. And so what gives us our value? When it comes to currency, the value of currency is stated by the seal of the government, the president, the prime minister, or the king. He marks it. He says, this is my seal. This is what I'm going to imprint upon it. And if the government imprints upon this piece of paper that it's $100, then its value is $100. And its value does not change when I crumple it up. Its value does not change when I go quadding and I get it covered in mud. Its value does not change because it has been imprinted by the leadership of the land to have that value. The second way, there's maybe three ways, the second and third way that things get their value in the world today is things have value based on their purpose. There's always value based on purpose, so like life support has a high value because its purpose is to keep you alive. Um, so, so its purpose, things are value, given value simply by their purpose. And finally, things are given value by what you're willing to pay for them. There are some things in this world that I think ought to be absolutely valueless, and yet I could never afford them. Like the artwork of like three lines and a polka dot, you know? And it's like six million dollars, and I'm like, seriously? Who gives that weird artwork that a child could do six million dollars of value? Well, its value is given to it by what somebody is willing to pay for it. Some of us here have fancy cars. Some of us have cars that are not so fancy. And uh, I have a car that is much newer than Wes's car. Wes has got an old, old car. It's got, like, no cool features. You still have to crank the windows, I think. You have to still crank the windows. You still have to push little things to lock it. Um, it's really, really not very spectacular in its, its fanciness. Where my car, my car has all the modern stuff. Now, I'm not going to ask Wes what he paid for his car. I think his wife already knows. I'm sure, I hope. But, you know, um, and somehow I probably couldn't sell my car for like 4000 bucks. And his car, which is how old is your car? His car is a 68. His car is way older than my car. And yet his car is worth significantly more than mine. Why? Because people are willing to pay that for his car, and they're not willing to pay that for mine. I am hoping to move closer to my mom's house, um, and I'm selling my house, and I hope that the value of my house is high. I know it probably isn't, but I hope that it is. And the reason I know it probably isn't is because my house is older than some newer houses. Now, it's still a super valuable if you're looking for a house, by the way. Super, super valuable. But for everybody else... You know, my house isn't as new as it once was. My house isn't in the country on a beautiful acreage. My house doesn't have some of the things. And I remember how it is when you buy a house. Now, when I bought this house, I didn't look at it a whole lot because I was in Africa. I just needed to buy a house. But I remember my first house. By the perimeter, by the floodway, uh, government was telling people they had to auction off their houses because of all the damage after the big flood. Uh, I think it was 97. And me and Dad went to those. These were all up for auction. There were two houses side by side, looked almost exactly the same. And, my, and you walked through, it was kind of an open house, and then you had to put your bid in later on. So my dad walks through, me and my dad, and he's like, oh, oh man, look at these cabinets. These are old cabinets. Oof, these are, he's talking way too loudly. I'm like, Dad, I'm right here. Yes, these are old cabinets. And then we go into the living room. We go into the living room, it's the ugly carpet in the living room. And he bends down, like he's like, oh, and he's, he's, he pulls out the vent and he's feeling the carpet. I'm like, he's like, oh. This carpet is really not in good shape. Okay, you know. Okay, and he's like, go to the basement. Now remember, this is a house that had to be moved. It, was, it had to be moved because there had been a flood. Goes to the basement, he's like, it smells mildewy down here. I, the, I guarantee they've had water in this basement. These walls are no good. And he goes on and on, just tearing down the condition of this house. We get to the car, and I'm like, Dad, I guess, like, I guess we don't want this house. He's like, oh no, you should have seen the hardwood floors underneath that ugly carpet. He said, you should have, he said, I, went, I, I was checking out what the flooring was. I wanted to see what I was actually getting. I wanted to see the heart of the house. 
the basement isn't coming with the house. You don't get to bring the basement with you. I don't care about the basement. But other people, other people in the building. So I get this house for like $13,000. The identical house, well not identical, almost identical layout house next door. Didn't have the hardwood floors though. Um, but it had newer cab. They might have even just been painted old cabinets. I don't know. Mine went for 13. That one I think went for 30 or something, maybe higher than that. The guy paid almost double what I paid for mine, over double what I paid for mine. And really at the end of the day, it was a couple cosmetic features that that one had over the other. And I thought, man, sometimes we value things when we do not see their purpose, we do not see their design, or instead of looking at what we're actually getting, we find things to pick on. Just like when people walk through a house and they go, oh, I don't, oh, you know, and, and they don't like this, or they don't like that, and it's like, that's a $6 feature that you can replace. You know, I don't like the way the lighting is in here. Yeah, 27 bucks and you get a brand new lighting. It doesn't diminish the value of the house by 20 grand. Like, seriously. But that's how we determine value in the world today. We, we, we tear it down. And so what's happened is most things that we purchase, most things that we buy, we, we start off by tearing down the value to try and convince the guy selling it that we shouldn't have to pay as much as they're asking for it. But at the end of the day, value is determined by what somebody is willing to pay. And so my question for you is what kind of value have you given yourself? Are you one of these people today who is looking at your life saying, I have made a thousand mistakes. I have done a lot of drugs. I've had a lot of sex. I've, I've hurt a lot of people. I've damaged a lot of lives. I am a broken person. I really don't have a whole lot of value. Who is setting your value? Because I want to remind you of something today. I want to remind you that you don't actually get to set your value. Your value is already set. Your value is set in every single criteria that we have just talked about today. Number one, your value is set because we are all underneath the King of Kings. And God, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, is the one who determines what our value is. And our value does not change based on how holy we have been. Our value does not change based on the mistakes we have made, how dirty we are, how wrinkled we are, how crumpled, how broken, how busted, how ruined, how hurt, and how flawed we are. Our value stays the same because it is the Father and it is the King who puts his mark upon our lives. If we allow ourselves to be marked, if we allow ourselves to be imprinted by the Holy Spirit, no matter what your brokenness has been, God says, today I want to imprint myself upon your life. You are currently a blank piece of paper. You are currently this, but there is nothing except for you not willing that will keep God from imprinting the Spirit upon your life that will give you a purpose and a future. It has been predetermined that He will do that for you. 1 Timothy 6, 13 to 16 reminds us of who God is. Maybe you need to be reminded of who God is this morning. God is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. In the sight of God who gives life to everything. And of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever and ever. Amen. God is the King of kings. God is the Lord of lords. God is the creator of all things. And one day every knee will bow and any, every tongue will confess that he is God. He is the one who determines our value. 
And every single time you devalue yourself, you're giving away what God has already given you. It's a little bit like when we were children and how easy we'd be tricked with two shiny loonies or one crumpled up piece of paper. We want two, you know, we'd, we'd trade away $20 for two shiny nickels because two is better than one. And the devil will lie to you and say in your brokenness and in your damage, you don't have value, but oh, he'll throw some shiny things in front of you that might make you feel important, that might make you feel valuable. And we exchange our value, our design, and our purpose for some garbage nickels and shiny pennies that are no longer even in circulation. You see, the king sets the price. Romans 8, 14 to 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. You see, this verse written to the early church says this. It says that we, we were a blank sheet. We did not have that value, but the King of Kings says, I want to imprint upon your life my Holy Spirit, that you can go from, from this to being sons and daughters of the King of Kings. Not only do, go, do you go from having lo, this low value, you go from having value and even being able to give value because you are valuable. But I want to remind you is that sometimes we'll preach a beautiful message that says that you have value, but we forget the important parts of Scripture. Just like this, it says, now if we are the children, if we are children, if we choose to follow God, if we accept the offering of the cross, if we do these things, we become marked and sons and daughters of the King of Kings. And we can always choose to be children of the King of Kings. And we can always choose to be heirs in the kingdom of God. And so if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory, this time on earth is not always easy. You might see yourself as broken, busted, old, wrinkled, hurting, damaged. Because that's the suffering of this world. But with the mark of the Holy Spirit, there is a future to come. And it is a future that is different if we choose to follow after God. God is the king. The king sets the price. The king sets the value. But God is not only the king, God is the creator. So if God is the king and he sets the price, God is the creator and he's the one who gives the purpose. And so we live in a world today where again, when we diminish our value, we so often diminish our purpose. And did you know that the Bible says that you have a purpose? You were created and designed for a future. A future that's better than you can imagine. And yet so often we get out of bed in the morning, we walk about our lives, and we just think our purpose is to exist. I don't want my purpose to exist. I don't want this $20 to just exist. I want this $20 to do something. <laughs> And so often we don't realize that if we, have, if we have a value and we have a purpose, that maybe we ought to be living out our purpose. God is the king and gives the price, and God is the creator who gives a purpose. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Ephesians 1, 3-6. Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which, which he has given us in the one, given us in the one he loves. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. And you will most often experience the fullness of your value. You will often fully embrace the understanding of your value. You will understand your worth 
worth so much better when you begin to live out your purpose? Are you living out your purpose? Psalms 139, 13 to 15 says, you were crea- for, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You see, when we look to Jesus, when we look to 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 Christianity, and we only see Christianity, we only see what God did on the cross as our ticket to heaven, we miss out on what God has for us. I realize that again and again, especially as I begin to see, see churches that so often forget to embrace the moving of the Holy Spirit. Churches that so, so often forget to embrace the, the, the purpose and the plan and the design and the gifts that God has given us. And so we sit around and we wait for good things to happen and we say, does God really want me to sacrifice? Does God really want me to do this? But when we read the Bible, God gives us value and God gives us purpose and God designed us. And so I want to challenge you today. If God gave you a design when he created you and if God knows every moment of your life, and if God can count the hairs on your head, then God knows how broken you were going to be, and God still has a plan for you today. God knows how broken you were going to be. God was not surprised by your failure. God was not just surprised by your damage. God was not even surprised by how you damaged others, and yet God says, if you turn your eyes to me, if you choose to enter into our, the, you know, the suffering of the cross, if you would, if you choose to make that decision today, I still have a purpose for your life. The purpose doesn't change because the great creator is also the great healer, the great fixer, the great restorer, the great forgiver, the great renewer. Because he has a plan for you. God is the king. He sets the price. He set, God is the creator. He gives the, he gives the purpose. And he is also the purchaser who's already paid for you. It doesn't matter what the world says your value is. It doesn't matter what a realtor tells me my house should sell for. If somebody wants to give me a million bucks for my house, I will take it. My house will now be worth a million dollars. And so when the price has been paid, no other offers are on the table. And if you want to offer me a million bucks, all the other offers are off the table. God sets the price, and then he pays a price far higher than anybody else could afford anyways. Because it is only God who could send Jesus Christ to die for me. And so the price has been paid. The price has been set. And the price that was set for me was the Son of God. I want you to just fathom that just for a second. Just think about this for a minute. The price was paid in Jesus Christ. And if the value was set, the price was paid in Jesus Christ, that means the value was set at the death of Jesus. And yet I go through my life so often dishonoring the price that was paid, diminishing my value and forgetting my purpose. And so Christianity really just seems like a club that I join. That it makes me feel good that I'm going to get to heaven one day. And I miss out on the incredible moving of the Holy Spirit. I miss out on the incredible miraculous things in the world. And because I so often fail to say, if I join in the suffering, if I'm willing to say, I'll take up my cross and follow him, if I'm willing to recognize that I have great value, I have great purpose, a great price has been paid, but God wants me to live it now. You see, at just the right time when I was still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
in your brokenness, in your bustedness, in your not living out your purpose. You know, I want you to imagine, as we have seen before, in the back of a pasture where the cattle are grazing, there sits a classic rusted out old orange car. The tires are gone. There's not much left. And somebody finds that old hunk of junk. And they say, ah, this thing's got purpose. This thing's got value. This thing's got a future. And they drag that beast out of the bush. They rebuild every single thing from the ground up until it shines like it ought to. They restore to it the original parts as best they can. And the thing's nearly priceless. Many of us have allowed ourselves to be dragged out into the back 40. We've allowed the devil to tell us to sit there till the engine's gone and rusted, till the tires have fallen off. Maybe you're still one of those people. You're, you're a Christian. You know, the classic car. I'm still the classic car. I'm just rusted out and beaten and bruised. I couldn't drive. You can barely drag me out. You've got to crane me up and put me on a truck to get me out of here. And yet Jesus paid the price while we were in that broken state. And so I want to remind you of something today. You are chosen and you are valued. You see, I'm just going to see if I can find that one part of notes that I got carried away on and might have actually deleted them. Oh, there we go. I want to remind us today that God has chosen you. And there's a couple stories in the Bible that really remind us of our purpose and of our choosing and of our calling and of who we are in Christ. You see, I want to remind you of something today. When Jesus was led up onto the mountaintop to be tempted in the book of Matthew 4, 8 to 10. We don't have that on the book. Jesus is led onto the mountaintop to be, te to be tempted. And what does the devil do? In an instant, the devil tried to trade you for a little bit of power. Up on the mountaintop, the devil doesn't want you. The devil tried to trade you. He said to Jesus, he said, look all around you at all the kingdoms of this earth. I will give them all to you if you bend the knee and you, you worship me. For a little bit of power, the devil was willing to trade you. But for a whole lot of torture and a horrific death on the cross, Jesus was willing to purchase you. Not for power, but for relationship. So that you could experience the purpose that he had for you. You see, the devil doesn't actually want you. The world doesn't want you and the world doesn't love you. And the world may say and the devil may say that you are loved here, you are wanted here, you are desired here. But we know no matter what, the devil doesn't want you. He just doesn't want God to have you. The goal of the devil is not to win you, it's to destroy you. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be alert and of sober mind, your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You see, the devil doesn't want you. He just wants to destroy you. God chose us to love us. He sent his son so that he could adopt us. See, when the devil tells you that you're useless, the world tells you that you're useless. It's because the devil and the world really don't have a use for you. It's why they try to trade you. They try to corrupt you. They try to ruin you. Because to the world and to the devil, you've got no use. I noticed this the other day when somebody was trying to get another Christian to do stuff that they knew they shouldn't do. We see this all the time. You, when I was going to school and the kids would say, my buddies would say, you need to go have some alcohol. Let's go do some drinking. You'd be a lot more fun if you were drinking. You'd, be like, well, you'd get invited to a lot more parties if you were drinking. You see, my friends didn't actually want me to be drinking. They just didn't want me not to be drinking because they didn't want to feel like there was another path to take. They weren't concerned about me. They weren't concerned about how much fun I could be. They just wanted to drag me to where they were. 
And I'm not talking about any alcohol, by the way. I'm not saying you can never touch alcohol. I'm talking about drunkenness and, and, the, and, and kind of the wicked stuff that we would get into when we were younger. You see, it's, the, the world doesn't want you. The world sells you a, a bill of sale, but all they're trying to do is devalue you. you. See, when the devil tells you you're useless, it's because he's got no use for you. But Jesus says you are called because God is the one who designed you. God gave you a purpose. You were created and designed for a purpose. And there is nothing that will ever take away the fact that God has a purpose for you. When the devil says you're worthless, it's because he wasn't willing to sacrifice anything for you. And so to the devil, you're worthless. But to Jesus, you are priceless because the price has been paid and he's the one who paid it when he went to the cross for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. If you are sitting here today and you're not sure about your faith, Maybe it's because you haven't found your purpose. Maybe it's because you still think faith is simply believing and doesn't involve the doing. Maybe you haven't realized that you can be a world changer. Maybe you haven't realized that there's a design on your life that will make you something more than you are today. Because when we water down Christianity, we water down our value, we water down our, the cross, we water down the purpose. And we water down the calling. Every single one of you, whether you're a kid here, an adult here, or a granny here, can live a life that is full of what God has for you. God called you. God gave you purpose. God forgives, restores, rebuilds all who are broken. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. God's purpose is seen. God's design is seen in your faithful decision to honestly love Him. For those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose, again, with the purpose, for those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. You see, you weren't justified. You weren't glorified. You weren't living out your purpose yesterday. But you can live out your purpose today. Because God can justify every brokenness. He can heal every wound. He can make you what you need to be. But Christianity and faith is not for the weak at heart. It is for those who are willing to say, I will give God everything. Take up your cross and follow me. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. But the Son of Man, the follower of God, has value above all. Purpose beyond comprehension. You were bought with a price. And so to wrap it up today, live like you have value. Live like you have value. I have my, my phone here, which doesn't have that much value, but to me, who's always cheap, it's got a lot of value, so I buy a case for it, I protect it, I, I, do, I don't just throw it around. I treat it like, like, it has, like it has value. Do I treat myself like I have value? Do I treat my neighbor like they have value? Do I treat myself like I have purpose? Am I pursuing my purpose above all else? Is church for me as an example just a Sunday thing or do I realize that I am part of a family and in this family we've been given a calling, a purpose, and a value? Am I engaged with God on a daily basis? As I want you to recognize that your purpose and your value are found in your repentance and in your submission. Are you willing to follow after God? Matthew 6.33 But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added.
to you. Those who seek to gain their lives will lose it, and those who lose their lives for the sake of God will gain it. I don't know who you are here today, but I can guarantee there are people here who've been throw, who've treating their Christianity like it's got no value. They've been treating their life like they have no purpose. They've just been doing it because it feels good to be part of a club that, that, that says that we get to go to heaven when other people don't. And as horrible as that sounds with people, that, 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 that's, that's how we sometimes think. And it may be not how we think, but it sure seems to be how we act sometimes. So i got a couple things this morning. Number one, if you have not asked God to be your Savior, if you have never said, God, I want to be adopted into your family, now is the time to do it. Because you have value, you have purpose, no matter about your condition right now. It does not matter when you give it to God. And so if you need to give your life to Jesus today, what I want you to do is we're going to have a prayer time later on. Come and pray with one of the people at the front and just say, hey, how do I join God's family? And it's going to be simple, just so you know ahead of time. It's going to recognize that you are, you, you are a sinner, that you don't have the imprint of God on your life right now, and that, 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 that you need that. And you acknowledge that you're a sinner. You repent and say, I'm going to, I'm going to try and follow after God. And you give your life to him. It's really not that complicated. He is God. He is the king. He sets value. He's the creator. I am a sinner. I don't set my value. So God, I want to be part of your family. And if you're a Christian here today who hasn't been living out the way you ought to, I want to just challenge you today. Uh, spend some time in prayer and come up and let us, let us worship. So we're going to have a prayer time up here at the front. And I want to challenge you guys, anybody going through anything, you've not been living your purpose, you've been treating yourself like you have no value, you've been struggling with things like that in your life, I want to challenge you to come up and pray with somebody. Not just those who need to find Jesus for the first time, but those who need to connect with God in a unique and special way today, come up and pray with somebody. And the last thing that I want to do is I want to remind you that all these young people here who are going off, uh, and some of the parents as well and the older people who are going off to Kenya, I'm sure they would also love for you to find them and pray for them. We have been designed, we have been created, we have a healer, we have a king, we have a father. So in these times of worship, let us give our lives to him in all that we can. Let's worship God. Yes.
This next song we're going to do is um, Revelation song, and I shared a little bit about this at the, the worship night we had a few weeks ago, but um, this is my favorite um, worship song because I just really love the picture that it paints. Um, this song is, uh, a bit of it is taken out of uh, Revelation 7, 9 to 12, and I just encourage you just to um, close your eyes while I read this and just really picture, um, just picture these words. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no no one could number from every nation from all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb and all the angels were standing around the throne and all the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I just think that's just a beautiful glimpse of um, what we're going to all experience when we get to heaven. So I just um, invite you just to really open your hearts just to receive the Holy Spirit this morning as we sing these next this next song. Yeah. 
going to sing one more song this morning.
Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Before you guys take off, just a quick reminder. Church is so, so, so much more than just coming on a Sunday morning, listening to a guy preach. Some weeks I hit it out of the park. Some weeks I don't. Some weeks it's good. Some weeks it's bad. If this is why you're coming, it's not really the bigger picture of church. It's so much deeper. Next weekend we do have church camping. I would love to see as many of you there as possible. Bring your kids. Let's fellowship. Let's have a good time. Let's learn what it means to be family in a setting that actually lets us be family. Uh, so either come out camping with us or show up each of the days or come to the service on Sunday morning. We want to see you there, whether you've been with us for many years or whether this is your first Sunday attending. Show up. Let your kids connect. Connect yourself. So we look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday, St. Malo, site number two. You can also visit all weekend uh, if you want to stop by and you're not camping. Anyways, God bless. Have an incredible week. Can't waste a day, cause I can't stay the same. I wanna be different, I wanna be changed till all of me is gone and all that remains is a fire so bright. The whole world can see that there's something different to so come and be.
Are you past the point of weave? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus. He makes a way.
Just like a lost cause If I were you I would have turned around and walked away I would have labeled me beyond repair Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair Oh, but somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here You're the God who stays You're the God Did you know you can find your favorite artist concerts on Spotify? Tap the button to see a list of upcoming, personalized, live and virtual events just for you. No matter how big or small your business is, making your own ad on Spotify Ad Studio is as easy as one, two, three. One, let us know what you want your ad to say and pick out your music. We'll voice and produce it at no extra cost. 